Good morning. Good morning. We need you out there. We the few but the mighty. Good to good to see you here with us this morning. Any uh, visitors? Anybody we want to recognize this morning? Help me out. I don't see well. Good to see Keith back with us. You're not running any marathons yet, are you, Keith? Not yet. Working your way up to it. That's okay. Any any others? Sam. Good to have you. Thank you. Well, we're glad you're all here. Uh, just a little taste of winter still. Trying to remind us that it's not spring till tomorrow or whenever that officially is. But <laughs> you know the calendar does what it does, and the weather does what it does. So that's okay. We are glad you're all here this morning. Welcome to New Brunswick Church of Christ. As always, sunny outside. It's not too windy. It's always warm in the Lord's house. Um, lots of things to mention, so I'll, I'll try to keep moving along here. Um, as you can see, most of them are in the bulletin, but I'll highlight a couple of them. Uh, adopt a grandparent is kicking off next Sunday, so be aware of that. Um, youth group tonight, and I appreciate the little note in there. It says the, there's going to be shenanigans. I don't know what the definition of shenanigans is, or if that has something to do with St. Patrick's Day, or whatever the case may be, but... If you'd like to find out what shenanigans are, you better be sure and be here. Um, there is a sign up in the back for the sunrise breakfast, so be sure and take advantage of that. We need everybody to kind of pitch in and help out supplying all the different things for the sunrise breakfast because what's Easter? Three weeks? Is that right? So it'll be here before you know it. So we appreciate your help there. Um, there's meetings tonight. Uh, the elders will be meeting at 5.30, and the, the rest of the leadership will be meeting at 6.30, so all the gentlemen and so forth involved with that, be sure and be here. A couple other things that are noted in the in your bulletin, um, Hanging Rock, camp, summer, hopefully good weather, spring, all those things are coming, so be aware of, of the camp things, There's a lot of good things to look for, and VBS is in there. Mark your calendars for VBS, and... and uh, Kathy will be looking for help. She already started, I'm sure, and she appreciates that. And uh, We always need your help, and that's a good way to serve. Like a, We read it. A, I gave her a copy of it. There was a devotional in Daily Bread on March the 16th, which would have been Thursday, and it would actually spoke of VBS, and it said it's not just for kids, which is very true. It's for all of us. We all need to kind of be revived sometimes. So I think... I've exhausted all my notes. Oh, um, there is an insert in there about Easter, celebrate Easter. That's a good way to invite people. I think Dwight mentioned that there's some little, like, flyers, if you will, that you can take to give to somebody, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker. Uh, everybody needs to share those and, and try to get some people here, not just for Easter, but that's as, as good a time as any. So be sure and take advantage of that. Anything else? You got anything you want to say, Ben? Bye. Ben's here. He's, he's helping out with worship, so get ready. Um, we'll move on to morning prayer. Any uh, updates? Any people that we need to specifically mention? Aleda? Yeah, you had that out on the prayer this morning. Sean Brazil, she mentioned, is back in the hospital. Others? That we should mention specifically. As always, you know, the, the prayer list is lengthy and there's lots of different. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's that I guess she had a, you said a, a slight heart attack, Terry Bolin. And then Danny had a kind of some form of not surgery, but he, he had something taken care of there too. So, yeah, I remember their family. Brad? Okay, Bob, Bob Pickering's at Restorus, he went through some rehab so because he, he fell and broke his kneecap. Any others? Like I said, the prayer list kind of goes on and on. It's a fluid thing. And we all need prayer. We know that in one way or another. So let's go to him right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this place of worship where we can come and 
share together, lift each other up, Lord. Uh, there's lots of needs out there, and you, you know what they all are. And we're just amazed by that. Thank you for your love and your grace and how you care for each one of us. And help us, Lord, to, to do our part as your hands and your feet to reach out to people and, and lift them up in any way that we can. Many were mentioned this morning that have been through some things specifically. And again, Lord, you know the, what those are. And we are aware of some, but many others are we are not. But you will take care of us all if we just look to you. And as we were reminded in uh, Sunday school this morning, sometimes, Lord, we're not necessarily tested when things are difficult. We're more tested when things are going well. Do we move away from you? Do we forget who you are? Help us not to do that. To uh, thank you for our blessings in the good times and lean on you in the difficult times for the strength that we need. We pray for our service this morning, Lord, as we bring praises to you and, and meet around your table and as Dwight shares the word. Help us to have open hearts and open minds as always, Lord. And when we leave this place, to take it with us, to put it into practice wherever we are. As we mentioned, inviting people and to Easter or whatever the case may be or just sharing the good news that someone cares, Lord, that uh, they were there for them in their difficult times and in the good times as well. Again, we thank you for Jesus and for this assembly, and we pray for the ones that are not here, the ones mentioned, as, as well as our shut-ins. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Psalm 66, 1 through 4 says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Let's stand and praise him together.
that you will and all the earth will sing your praises Praises one day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men. My example is He. The Word became flesh, and the light shined among us, His glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. mountain one day they nailed him to tree on a tree in suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he the, the hand that, that healed nations stretched out on a tree took the nails for me living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glory one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now is ascended my lord evermore death could not hold him the grave could not keep him from rising again living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day glorious day one day the trumpet will sound for his shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day glorious day oh glorious day oh glorious day oh, glorious day. 
may be seated. Today, we'll be looking at the impact of the cross through the eyes of Jesus' enemies who were delighted by the cross. Jesus was scorned and rejected by those who opposed him, but yet he went to the cross for the sins of us all. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since first has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he Turns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand here in the power of Christ I stand Jesus was above all powers, all kingdoms, all wisdom. Yet he went to the cross willingly, and he suffered great anguish for you and for me. Above all wisdom and all the way. 
My meditation this morning is entitled, No Tourniquet Required. Some time ago, a newspaper carried a story about a woman who called 911 after a medical port dislodged from her arm. Blood was spurting everywhere, she recalls. The EMS unit that responded was equipped with a new tourniquet that was designed for military use. This new design, said a fire chief quoted in the article, locks into place so that it doesn't become loose or shift during transport to the hospital. It does a much better job of stopping the flow of blood. In this case, the tourniquet helped save a woman's life. Stopping the flow of blood when a serious injury occurs is what we want to do to save life, for the loss of too much blood will result in death. The Apostle Paul described the cup of the Lord's Supper as a participation in the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. That the outpouring of Jesus' blood was not halted meant death for him, but life for us. Jesus cried out as he was dying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the separation that Jesus experienced meant renewed fellowship with God for us. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus could have provided the equivalent of a tourniquet. He could have called 12 legions of angels, 72,000 of them, to come and rescue him from his enemies, Matthew 26, 53. But the love of God had decreed that the blood of Christ should flow that day. No tourniquet devised by man would have been strong enough to stop it. It is never accurate to say that Jesus' life was taken from him. He made it clear that he gave his life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. John 10, 18. The prophet Zechariah used the image of a fountain to picture the continual flowing of the blood of Christ that still carries the power to cleanse from sin and impurity. Zechariah 13, 1. William Cowper expressed that truth in the words of a widely known hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood 
exalt their guilty stains. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the, the power of Jesus' blood. And help us at this time to slow down and reflect and really draw close to you in thankfulness and in remembrance of Jesus' great sacrifice. And we use these emblems, Lord, to remind us of that broken body and shed blood. And may we always be mindful, thoughtful, and prayerful at this time that we would never take this great sacrifice for granted. And help us at the same time, Lord, to examine our own lives and where we are in our walk with you, that we can continue to grow and be stronger in our faith and in our life for you that we live each and every day. Again, we thank you for Jesus and the great sacrifice he made and this blood that makes us clean. And help us at every opportunity, Lord, to express that to others, that they might hear the good news and, and experience that cleansing as well. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Just as Christ faced many enemies as followers of him, we too will face opposition. But Christ defeated death, and he offers eternal life to those who accept his gift of salvation and choose to follow him. And because of that promise, we can praise God even in the middle of the storms. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive I raise 
is a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Here you plus your hold on me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Let's sing a little louder. Let's sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing, sing a little, little louder. louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the King is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated. The King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. Up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated. The King is Children are already departing, so I don't have to say anything this time. 
Some years ago, a 14-foot bronze crucifix was stolen from the Calvary Cemetery in Little Rock, Arkansas. It had stood at that entrance to that cemetery for over 50 years. Uh, the cross was out there, uh, put there in uh, 1930 by a Catholic bishop and at that time had been valued at more than $10,000. The thieves apparently cut it off at, at its base and hauled it off in a pickup. Police speculate that they cut it up into smaller pieces and sold it for scrap. Uh, they figured that the 900-pound cross probably brought, at that time, uh, less than $500. So obviously they didn't realize the value of the cross. I think that's the problem with our lost world, understanding the value of the cross. As the gospel writers relate what we've looked at over the last few weeks, uh, the story of the Lord's crucifixion, the theme that runs through all the, uh, the, all the details is the rejection of that which we find sacred. Not only did people not see the value of Jesus, but they also didn't see the value of his death. They were, they were blind to that. And there are still people who are adamantly opposed to the cross today. They see Jesus as a threat to their beliefs or their lifestyle, their ambitions, their freedoms. And some go to extreme measures to eliminate the cross. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, As I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is pointing out that the cross is a, a symbol of our past sin. It's a reminder of what we were, but it's also a reminder that those sins were forgiven because of what took place at the cross, and our future is secure and there is something that we have to look forward to that is beyond anything that we could ever dream or imagine here on earth. But why are we surprised that there are still enemies of Christ? I mean, because from the time he arrived, um, people tried to kill him. King Herod tried to kill Jesus when he was just an infant. And when he first began his ministry, the people of his hometown in Nazareth tried to throw him off the edge of a cliff because they had disagreed with what he was teaching. And finally, after three and a half years of intense opposition, the religious leaders were successful in nailing him to a cross. Why was, why was Jesus so, so hated by his enemies that they were determined to kill him? Why were they elated at the sight of Jesus being tortured, ridiculed, rebuked uh, on the cross? I think that it's always going back to the same old thing, and that's that we have to look at the perspective of those who were gathered around the cross. And that's what we've done over the last few weeks, and we'll do for just a, a few more weeks as well. I believe that from the perspective of the enemies, they were delighted at what was taking place, even gloating about what was happening. And I believe it's important because if we see the Christian life it, it, if we live the Christian life in the real world today, uh, we're going to encounter some enemies as well. So that's the idea, the theme that I want us to consider this morning. Uh, you have some notes there in front of you. Maybe you can follow along and find something that will challenge you or inspire you. The, the first is the reason for their animosity. And I, and I believe that was en envy. Uh, look here in Matthew chapter 27. It says that Pilate knew it was out of envy that the religious leaders had handed Jesus over to him. Out of envy of what he stood for. Jesus posed a genuine threat to the religious establishment of his day. You see, before Jesus came on the scene, before he arrived uh, to, to reach to the people, 
the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, they were considered the respected leaders of that day, the religious authorities, and people flocked to hear what it was that they had to say. But when a young 30-year-old carpenter came from Nazareth, the, all that changed. As Jesus began his ministry, people were overwhelmed by what he offered. Jesus performed spectacular miracles. Nothing, had ever, nothing that they'd ever seen before. Uh, something that the religious leaders couldn't duplicate. And his teaching was, was fresh. It wasn't the same old stuff that the religious leaders had been teaching for years and years. It was insightful. It was ins inspirational. Before, everything had been old and superficial. Now this was new. And there was definitely an anointing of God, an anointing of the Holy Spirit. So the crowds left the religious leaders, and they began to follow after Jesus in multitudes. And that made the religious leaders very jealous. And jealousy is a, a horrible thing. Um, we, uh, Joe and I drove uh, yesterday to Cincinnati to celebrate our grandson's birthday. His birthday is on St. Patrick's Day. The birthday party was yesterday. Some of you got a chance to meet him last week, and some of you were delighted, I guess, by how he just kind of fit in. He's got that kind of personality. But the question has been asked over the last several months about if it was time for him to have a baby brother or baby sister. And every single time that something is said about him having a sibling, he is adamant. No, I don't want a brother. I don't want a sister. And finally, I just said, dude, what, what, what's, what's the problem? He said, I like mommy just to myself. And, and that's basically it. He, he, he is envious of the, the time that he shares with his parents. He doesn't want to share them with anyone else. I, I think that's the way the, the religious leaders were at that day. They liked the fact that everybody was coming to them. They didn't want to share that time with anybody else, especially somebody who was doing things drastically different than they were. So the religious leaders did their best to, to ask Jesus tricky questions. Many of you have read that throughout the, old, uh, uh, throughout the life and ministry of Christ. They, they tried to make him look bad in public. And the problem was, the more difficult the questions, the more impressive Jesus' answers were, and the more the people flocked to hear him. For, for instance, when they said, what do you think, Jesus? Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus answered, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. And the people were impressed by that. Or tell us, Jesus, this woman, we just caught her in the very act of adultery. Now, the law says she's to be stoned. Now, what do you say? And Jesus said, well, if that's the law, uh, maybe it needs to be fulfilled. But let he who has no sin in his own life cast the first stone. And one by one, those who were of age began to drop their stones and move away because they knew within their own heart and their own lives that they weren't perfect either. Jesus, you... Uh, you're driving out demons by the power of the devil. And Jesus said, that's ridiculous. No, no house divided will ever, will ever stand. And in Luke 13, look what it says. One, one of these encounters were, 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 when that had taken place, all his opponents were humiliated. And the people were delighted with the wonderful things that he was doing. While they were humiliated, they were frustrated. They couldn't trap him, and they were becoming more and more. Jesus was becoming more and more popular. And on top of that, Jesus really didn't kind of make himself good as far as the leaders were concerned. He alienated uh, them by, by just pointing out how terrible they were. He pointed out that they were hypocritical. He pointed out, uh, he referred to them as uh, snakes or blind guides or whitewashed tombs or sons of hell. I mean, that's not the way that you try to win friends and influence people. So no wonder the religious leaders were beside themselves with envy and anger. No wonder that they wanted to just get rid of him at all costs. 
Now, my point is this, and it's there for you to consider. Christians today are going to encounter some enemies too. Now, some of them are for the wrong reason. Sometimes we encounter enemies because of we're hypocritical, or, or sometimes we're not actually forthright. Sometimes we make judgment calls that are, are poor judgment calls, or we make enemies because of the th mistakes that we've made, or maybe because of the way we've treated people. I'm not talking about situations like that. I'm talking about the kind of enemies we have because we are living a genuine life in Christ. And in the real world, they don't want to see that type of life. They, they don't want to see people who are completely different. If you have your Bibles, turn here to John uh, 13 or 15 for just a moment. Look what Jesus reminded us of. In John 15, jump down to verse um, 18. It says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And so if you have enemies that you have to deal with because of the life that you're living, attracting people to Jesus... Just keep in mind that they hated Jesus because of the life that he lived. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. People may oppose your theology. Uh, they may see you as a threat to their lifestyle. And, and they don't want to hang out with individuals like that because you're completely different. There are people who oppose you because you believe that God created the world in seven days, just as we read about it in Scripture. Uh, they oppose you because you believe that this book is without error, and it's a guideline for the life that you live in our world today. They, they oppose you because you understand that there's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. When he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. You believe that Jesus is someone who has lived the life and in a perfect way and given his life as a ransom for each one of us. Our loyalty is to Christ, and there are a lot of people that just don't understand that. And our love for him and our service to him is because of all that he's done for us, not because we have to, but because we want to. And people get irritated at us sometimes because they see that as a threat to their lifestyle. You may not actually say anything about their lifestyle, but because you refuse to drink or you refuse to have affairs or you refuse to endorse drug habits or speak the way they speak or do the things that they do, it becomes an indictment on them that you're completely different and you're held to a different standard. And so sometimes they just want nothing to do with you. If you have ideas that are, are in following this book, they want no part of that. I was telling somebody a couple weeks ago, uh, and I had remembered this story, so I threw it in here for this morning. In my first preaching ministry... I don't remember exactly what I was preaching that evening, but it was on a Sunday night, and, uh, and I was preaching something about uh, the, the way God has set authority into place. And Christ is the head of the church, and then you have the elders and the deacons, and et cetera, and everybody just falls in line to the authority figures. And, and that was in a day back in the 70s where there were still issues about the woman's role in the church. And and I was trying to explain that, you know, all of us fall under the authority of Christ. All of us fall under the authority of the elders, etc. After the service was over, there was a lady who, I was in my 20s. She was old. She must have been like 35. <laughs> and I could tell that she was not coming up to me to tell me what an inspiring message I had just presented. And as she got from about me to to John, she starts wagging her finger like this. And I braced myself because I knew it was coming. I just didn't know what. And she began flailing away on me about what I had just presented and how she as a woman was entitled and, and she thought that this and had this in mind. And she's doing that as everybody is just walking past me. Usually they would stop and shake hands, but everybody seemed to be afraid of her and they just 
made their way around me. They didn't want any part of what I was just receiving. So I listened and I listened. And every once in a while, she would take a breath. So I would say a word or two. And finally, she recaps everything that she just said. And she looked at me and she says, the way I see it, because you're just another one of those male chauvinists, just like Paul, just like Jesus, you're nothing more than a male chauvinist. Now, I probably didn't do myself any service when I just grabbed on to a big smile and I looked at her and said, that is the greatest compliment anybody has ever given me to say that I'm just like Jesus, I'm just like Paul. And it probably didn't help Eddie that I searched for scripture and the Lord gave me a scripture when it says, bless are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, because of the Son, because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and be exceedingly glad because that's the way they treated me before you. And she just went, did one of those things well and left and I never saw her again. Surprise, surprise. Jesus says, don't get all panicky because they've in, that envy has led to insults and hatred before you and it will continue even after you. Now, the result of that animosity is crucifixion. If you still have your Bibles open, uh, move over to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, we have this passage of scripture that talks about the religious leader's reaction after Jesus performed what may have been his, his greatest miracle. I mean, outside of his own resurrection, here in John chapter 11, we have the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And, and Lazarus has been dead for four days. Jump down to verse 47. It says, then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. And they said, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both of our place and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. He said, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. And so John kind of adds, by the way, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for the nation, but also for the scattered children of God. And then look how he finishes up the thought there in verse 53. He says, so from that day, they had this plot to take the life of Jesus. These religious leaders from that point on formed a conspiracy to crucify the Lord. Mark 14 talks about how they, they were looking for the perfect time. Because they knew the way Jesus had, uh, how he had ingratiated himself with the people, that they would not stand for something like that to take place. So they didn't want to do it during a feast because the people might riot. So several times in the Old Testament, we will read that. They were afraid of the people or they didn't act because Jesus was too popular. But then they got their break they needed. They got this guy named Judas. And Judas said, hey, I know where Jesus hangs out at night. And I know where you can get him, where he's alone, just, just a handful of men and the people aren't around. And you can get him for a song, a price. And then they put him on trial, which was a fiasco at night when it was against the law to do so. They, they held a trial and, and they tried to form this conspiracy against him, getting people to lie about him. And they finally had a couple of witnesses whose story seemed to run true to, with one another. And Jesus, surrounded by these religious leaders of that day, fell to their argument as they to told him, you have to answer what we're saying. And the only thing that was missing was, as Jesus spoke the truth to them, was 
somebody saying, you just can't handle what he has to say. The crucial step in their conspiracy plot was to get permission from the government because they didn't have that right. So they had to go to the Romans to get Jesus' execution on the docket. And so they went to Pilate the next morning and they arranged for Pilate to have some time alone with Jesus and he inter interrogated Jesus and came out there with saying, I find no fault in him. And, and the people again began to hurl their threats that if you don't do something that we're going to let Caesar know that you're in cahoots with this man Jesus and that you're not really uh, somebody who's there for Caesar and everything just kind of spiraled out of control. Mark 15 says, those who passed by as Jesus hung from the cross heard the insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him again and again. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. That had to be infuriating. That had to be irritating. The thought that I've put there in your notes, being defeated by your enemies is even more difficult if they gloat over it. I, I mean, it's one thing to lose. It's a completely different thing when people start gloating over what happened. Just a side note, yesterday we were at that party and they, it was filled with Ohio State and Penn State fans. We walked into an ambush. Oh, and they were, they were terrible. And I, the only thing worse than Purdue losing is having to be with a bunch of Ohio State fans and Penn State fans the next day and having to listen to the whole thing. The world, in a sense, is waiting to gloat over the fall of someone who claims a higher standard of morality. When Christians fall, the world can't stand to, to wait any longer than they have to before they can start gloating over the fact that you're no different than the rest of us. When David was approached by Nathan after his adultery with Bathsheba. Do you remember what Nathan said? He said, you have given the enemies of God an, an occasion to blaspheme. You've given the enemies an opportunity to mock. I'll be honest with you. There, there are a lot of incentives that I have uh, to remain pure and upright. There's, there are a lot of reasons that I, I find it necessary to to watch my language and watch where I go and watch what I do. One, I'm afraid of my wife. <laughs> but more than anything, I'm afraid of what it would do to the church. I'm afraid of what it would mean if, if I failed and people saw that and how they would ridicule the church that I love for what the church means to the Lord. We live in a small community, and people know who you are, and they know what you say you stand for, and your reputation matters, and your faithfulness and your commitment matters, and we have been challenged to live a life that reflects Christ, and we need to be mindful that people are watching everything that we do. They're not just watching me. They're not just watching the elders. They're watching every single one of us. We cannot give the enemies of Christ an occasion to gloat. We need to walk worthy of the calling that we've received. Because the enemy is just looking for the opportunity to tear apart what the Lord has already built. The last thing is this, maybe the most important, and that's how we respond, how Jesus responded, and that's the act of forgiveness. I'm always amazed at the, the restraint that Jesus had when he was on the cross. 
They cried out, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross and save yourself. And you know what? He could have done that, but, but he didn't because you were more important. He could have, as Terry pointed out, he could have called thousands and thousands of angels to come to his assistance, but he didn't because he cared about us. That would have been the human thing to do, to retaliate, to seek help. I know I'm running out of time, but be patient with me because I think this is worth the, the effort. Most of you know Muhammad Ali or know of Cassius Clay. I heard the story a while back. When he was a little boy, his parents gave him a brand new bicycle. We bought Corbin a scooter for his birthday. But before he could even enjoy his brand new bike, somebody stole it. In the city of Louisville, as uh, things would happen, there will always be somebody looking for an advantage over someone. And the story goes that Ali decided to, to search for that bike himself. So as a small boy, he's going through the streets of Louisville looking for the bike and the person who stole it. And one day he was uh, seen by a policeman. And the policeman said, if you find your bike, and if you find the person who took it, what are you going to do? And uh, Ali said, I have no idea. And so it was that policeman who took him to a gym and taught him how to box. And it started working with him and working with him. And when he rose up through the golden gloves categories and things like that, he said every time he stepped into the ring, he would look across and see his opponent. And he would think to himself, that's the guy who stole my bike. And all he could think about from that point on was retaliation. And that's human nature. But that's not Christ-like. And what I see in the life of Jesus is completely different than what I see in our world today. And there are three lessons there at the bottom for you to take home with you. Number one, always speak the truth. Don't compromise. That's where we sometimes get ourselves into trouble. We try to compromise. We try to make everybody happy. I've been asked numerous times over the years, how do you keep everybody in the church happy? And my answer is always the same. I don't try. Because there's always going to be somebody who wants one thing and somebody else who wants the exact opposite. And I just tell folks, I just want my relationship with the Lord to be what it ought to be, and I want him to be happy. And then hopefully that will just kind of work its way through to the church family. All we need to know is that we try to hedge or compromise. We're just creating more problems for ourselves. Just in the short amount of time I've been here, I've been asked questions by people, all questions I've heard before. How do I feel about this book? the authority of the scripture, the inerrancy of the scripture. I've been asked questions about uh, same-sex marriage and the whole homosexual agenda. I've been asked questions about abortion and heaven and hell and the second coming. Yesterday, at Corbin's birthday party, a lady came up to me and she said, Devin tells me you're a pastor. And I said, yeah. And she said, I grew up in a very strict religious home. I knew right away what was coming. And I just wanted to look at her and say, hey, this is Saturday. I'm working tomorrow. <laughs> but she wanted to know my viewpoint on alcohol and social drinking. And I thought, this is not my work day. I only work on Sundays. And I ended up having a 15-minute conversation with a lady I've just met for the first time because she wanted to know where I stood. And you're gonna run into things like that. And my, my response is always the same. Just be truthful, just be honest, and more than anything, be loving. The second thing is love your enemies and don't retaliate. That's what Jesus did. 
the very first words out of his mouth, Father, forgive them. Sometimes that's difficult for us. When somebody is rude to me, simply because I'm a Christian, because I'm a preacher, simply because I love the church, when somebody's rude about the church, sometimes my first reaction is to just get right back in their face. But Jesus didn't die for us so that we could treat people the way people treated him. He died for us so that we could treat people the way Jesus did treat people. We need to be different. We need to love our enemies. He said, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of the Father in heaven. And then the last thing, just consider the source. Jesus died, and he knew that these people really didn't know what they were doing. They were being used by the evil one. The enemy was not the religious leaders. The real enemy was Satan. Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world. Our enemy is not the people in the world around us. Our enemy is the one who's trying to lead them to destruction. And even the religious leaders of that day finally came to that conclusion. On the day of Pentecost, if you read Acts chapter 2 sometime later this week, you'll see that even many priests came to the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. From his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose such a crown? And were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for sometimes just going along with the crowd, being like everybody else, forgetting who it is that we represent, being what we ought to be, who we ought to be. Father, help us to separate ourselves from the rest of the world and to be living in such a way that draws people closer to Christ. My people see Jesus living in us. People that are loving and forgiving, honest and forthright, faithful and committed to lifting up the cross because of what took place there for each of us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song of invitation and we always want to offer that as a means of maybe you have something you'd like someone to pray about or maybe you'd like to make a decision for Jesus. We want to do that right now. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucify, they laugh and scorn him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb.
Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died. But you have brought me to your side To be led by your staff and rod And to be called a Lamb of God O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God I love the Holy Lamb of God Oh, wash me in his precious blood Till I am just a lamb of God Oh, lamb of God, sweet lamb of God I love the holy lamb of God Oh, wash me in his precious blood Till I am just a lamb of God Who oh, wash me in his precious blood Till I am just a lamb of God Thanks, uh, Dwight, for sharing with us, and thank you all for being here, and be sure and take note, there is a thank you in there from the Schaefer's for last week. It's kind of at the end of his sermon notes, and sometimes we don't all get there like we should, so be sure and, and take note of that, and let's uh, dismiss with prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the power that you give each one of us to live a life for you, and we pray that... Uh, we can take the words that Dwight has shared with us this morning and uh, put them to work, Lord. Uh, we need to uh, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. And help us to do that, Lord. Help us to always know that you're right there with us in the good times and the bad. We thank you for everyone again that's here this morning, for the blessing it's been to be here, and help us to shine that light wherever we go. In your name we pray. Amen. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. blessed week.